Okay, so yeah, welcome everyone to um, the last of our seminar series. Um, and so it's my great pleasure to introduce our last speaker, um, who is Professor John Sutton. Um, so as many of you know, John was my PhD supervisor, um, and he's been really influential in, in my career. Um, and I think John is a role model in you know, how to be a good philosopher um, and how to live a really rich and kind of full life, I think. Um, so yeah, we can learn a lot from, from John's uh, experience and influence. Um, so John is an Emeritus Professor of Philosophy and Cognitive Science at Macquarie University in Sydney in Australia. Um, and currently he's also a fellow at the Institute for Advanced Study in Paris, um, where he's working on a project entitled Place and Memory, Cognitive Ecologies of a City. Um, so John works in philosophy of mind, cognition and action, cognitive psychology and the interdisciplinary cognitive humanities. So he's got research interests in autobiographical and collaborative memory, body memory and skilled movement, distributed cognition and cognitive history. So he's published extensively on these and other topics, including his fantastic 1998 book, um, Philosophy and Memory Traces, which is a classic on the field. Um, so John's approach, I would say, is inherently interdisciplinary. Um, he tries to bring humanities, social sciences, and cognitive science together and to integrate conceptual, ethnographic, and experimental methods. And um, so today he's going to give a talk on the Wisconsin moment. And I think um, this talk will resonate with that interdisciplinary approach. Um, so please join me in welcoming, welcoming uh, Professor John Sutton. Thank you so much, Chris, for those very kind words. Uh, I should tell everyone, Chris has been a pretty major influence on me as well since we uh, we have um, got together. Um, now, hang on, let me just get this right. I want to share a window. Uh, all right. Um, this worked a minute ago, so what if I... Uh, I'm not getting the share screen that I got before when we tried that, am I? That's it, yes. It seems to be coming through. Um, oh, but where is, where is my... Um, is Are you seeing my... No. Yeah, no. I, okay, it's... I did the same thing I did when we tried that, Chris. Um, let, me, let me start again. So I'll stop. I'll hit the... This is a new system for me. Sorry, everybody. Um, if I hit uh, go for a window, right? I've got my PowerPoint open. Um, but I didn't get, I'm not getting the same option. I'm just getting the, um, the, the set of screens in this meeting. That's maybe I'll just close my PowerPoint and open it again. Sorry about this, everybody. Um, yeah, it's not your fault. Don't worry. Most peculiar, okay. Okay, I've opened up my slides again, come back to the meeting, present a window. And yeah, Chris, it's not showing me what it did when we tried it then. Um, I'm only getting a window of the meeting. Um, and if you share your full screen, so that sometimes can create problems, but I think if you click on the PowerPoint when you're in that. Okay, okay. Let's... Got it. Is that going to you now? Mm, let's see. No. Uh, some, yeah, that's it. Yeah? Yep. Yeah, perfect. All right, I'm, I'm sorry about that. And so um, you can see me as well as the slide, can you? Yeah. Brilliant, all right, uh, which is good, everybody, um, because yes, I, I, when I'm giving this talk in person, I do a little bit of acting out. Um, so I'll try to keep some movement as part of the, the project. And right, so I can't see you guys, so please interrupt if anything goes wrong or if we need to take a break. Um, or whatever. Okay. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much. It's really um, great uh, to, to be speaking to your, your group. Um, thank you for giving up part of Friday afternoon um, for this. 
Um, so yeah, as Chris said, this is is very much a, a kind of experiment in um, quite direct interdisciplinary interaction, um, as as you'll see. It's a paper co-authored um, with Kath Bicknell and Celia Harris. You'll you'll see uh, Kath's role in in a minute, well, and and, and Celia's later. It's a paper reporting um, work that we actually did quite some time ago. And the date, um, as you'll see, will matter. We did the empirical work um, that we're reporting here in late 2016. Um, lots of things have intervened, some some good reasons, some less good reasons for why um, we're, we're still working on this material now. Um, but this is the very kind of last push to try to um, finish writing it up and submitting. Um, so it's a really great time for me to be able to present it and get some feedback from you. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's pitch away. The Wisconsin moment. So as I hope you can see in this picture, um, on the left, Howard and Fran sit next to each other on an old comfy two-seater couch in their home. Tom, who's one of the psychologists, sits facing them. Amanda is behind them. She's off screen. She's off to their right at a table. The ethnographer, Kath, squats on the ground off to their left. On the sofa, Howard is on Fran's right. He's fairly rigid, feet flat on the floor, hands crossed in his lap. She relaxes into the back of the couch. Her left foot is crossed over her right, jiggling. It could be nervous energy or anxiety. The fidget shifts to her hand or plays with her glasses or rubs her arm. It's a way of concentrating during the testing or a way of marking time. They both want to do well. They do what they can to keep their focus on the tasks. After the first tasks, which are remembering word lists, Tom asks the couple to work together to name as many states in the USA as they can in four minutes. All three of them share a smile. It's not the first time they've shared a moment like this. So Fran and Howard look out and across, keeping each other in their peripheral vision. And she appears poised. She's happy to let him start. He takes a breath. New York, Pennsylvania, he says. He's speaking to no one in particular, but loud enough for everyone to hear. Fran starts. Whisk, whisk. And she looks at Howard, conferring. Wisconsin? Huh? He says, looking toward her. No, I'm working down the East Coast, he says. They both smile and laugh. His is a quiet chuckle, and she's more expressive. It feels a bit like they're sharing a joke, as if it's typical he'd have some strategy like that. Ah, sorry, she says, laughing playfully and touching him on the arm. You go. She leans back into the couch again, looking up and away from him. She's focused, monitoring, trying not to intrude. We watched a lot of this on television last week, Howard says to Tom, who doesn't react. He can't react due to the protocols established for these tests. Last week was the Trump-Clinton election. So Howard continues, North Carolina, South Carolina, Ohio, says Fran. It's not acknowledged by Howard. Kentucky, Florida. Oh, Ohio. And what's that river down there, New Orleans, that river that runs up from there, he says. Fran's not sure. Her arms and legs are crossed and she holds her glasses on her chin. It's as though part of her wants to say other things and part of her is holding it all in. She comes up with the odd name, but he's more confident. She sometimes refers to people or events. He sticks to the task more directly naming states, talking in terms of directions and geographical features. Well, what are those ones in the middle, he says, and mentions lakes. Uh, the ones where they voted for Trump, she says, overlapping him, her hand motioning in a circle in front of her. They persist, talking quietly as the gaps between answers get longer. Well, that's four minutes, says Tom. It's a long four minutes, isn't it? Now, how much of your recall was from those elections last week? Oh, most of it, says Howard. Well, have you been to the States before? Asks Tom. Never, she says, shaking her head. No, we haven't, says Howard at the same time. Tom jokes that Australians are probably better at naming states in the US than the other way around. Everyone laughs. Fran and Howard are volunteers in the Australian Imaging, Biomarker and Lifestyle Study of Aging, ABLE. It's a longitudinal study of people who were over 60 back in 2006. 
Over 1,100 participants have been screened and tested every 18 months for cognition and mood, health and lifestyle, and with brain imaging. The idea is to identify biomarkers for the early detection of Alzheimer's disease. Among the aims of the ABLE project is to improve early detection of dementia and of the underlying disease. Another way to put that aim, and this is the aim that interests us, is to understand more about the many people whose brains show clear signs of Alzheimer's disease when they die on post-mortem, but who have lived a pretty normal life without symptoms. So, I mean, it, it differs in different studies, but around a quarter, sometimes as much as a third of general studies of um, large numbers of older people, people who die without having ha had any signs of dementia actually have Alzheimer's disease. Um, to some some degree, and yet that hasn't influenced their life. They haven't developed the symptoms of dementia. So um, this is called cognitive reserve. Some, something keeps the cognition working, right, even though the brain shows the tangles and plaques typical of Alzheimer's disease. So what are the sources of this cognitive reserve, which might protect or buffer some people against the disease? So we wonder if social interaction might play some role. Now, these participants in the ABLE study, they're all volunteers. It's a pretty homogenous sample from a socioeconomic point of view. This, this is um, basically the suburban middle classes, um, people who have some time and, and resources to be able to give their time to science. So they're not representative of the Australian population as a whole. It turns out that among the 700 odd participants who are classified as completely healthy control subjects, so people who have no incipient cognitive impairment when they're tested, and people of these people who are also open to further research participation, which is where we come in. So there were 94 people who were actually couples, in other words, 47 couples um, living with each other where both members of the, 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 the couple are participants. But until we came along, they had never been tested as couples within the ABLE study. They'd only been tested as individuals, just separate numbers in the, science, in the studies. So for the main ABLE study, the couples travel into the city every 18 months or so. They take a battery of standard tests, clinical tests, cognitive tests, tests of individual memory. And they tell us um, when they debrief after our kind of different session in their home, their tests for ABLE can leave them feeling puzzled and inadequate, even though they absolutely believe in the value of contributing to medicine and science as participants. Of course, like many older people, they have real anxiety about memory decline. Some of them, even though they're classified as healthy and they don't have any signs even of mild cognitive impairment, let alone of a more serious um, cognitive decline, some of them, though, are what's called subjective memory complainers, people who give higher answers to scores about your own concerns about your memory or your own sense that your memory um, might be failing. Now, there's actually very little correlation between subjective concern about your memory and Alzheimer's disease. In fact, it's, it's, it's often the case that people genuinely suffering from Alzheimer's disease are relatively unaware of, of, of that. But these two people, Howard and Fran, score fairly highly on the subjective memory complaint um, score, as do quite a number of the, the couples who we, we work with. That's shown by some of the things that Fran and Howard tell us. Um, Fran says that she always wants to be good at the test, both the ones for us and for the larger ABLE study. But she says, I feel inadequate. I feel completely inadequate. Her husband responds, but you don't need to. And she says, but I do, I do. So what we're gonna do now is pan back and, and I'm gonna try and explain something of the research program which led to this moment, this Wisconsin moment. Uh, and then we'll return to that moment, that exchange between the, this married couple uh, later in the talk to try to understand what uh, might have been going on there. So in the next section um, on collaborative recall, we're gonna pan back to kind of the, the origins and the heart um, of the research program um, that we've been engaged in for more than 15 years now um, on what happens when people remember together, what happens when people remember all kinds of things, uh, the past or uh, other matters together. So here's a little bit of, of background motivation for what we've been doing. As you all know, um, we talk together about past experiences all the time. Um, this happens around the family dinner table. It happens with, with couples. It happens with friends who haven't seen each other, whether it's for a day or a week or years. Um, it happens with colleagues at work. Um, you know, oh, how was your night last night? And so on. Um, there's a huge variability in the ways that we do this, in the reasons we do it, and in how it operates um, in knitting social groups together, in maintaining a sense of identity or a sense of community. 
Um, we also talk about the past when we're thinking about the future in order to direct our thoughts, our emotions, our actions um, into the past, by but into the future by trying to learn from what's happened in the past to us and to other people. Now, among the stronger cases, um, among this variety of, of ways in which we remember together, we're interested in ones, I guess, at one end of the spectrum, um, where there are people who know each other well. O obviously, older couples are a very clear example of that, but, but we're also thinking of, of other um, relationships within families or friends or small groups at work. Stronger cases where there's a shared history, uh, where people have been through many experiences together. And then when they turn to remembering those experiences, they often naturally interact they, they discuss, they negotiate, they uh, try to understand the meaning or the importance or, or retrospectively kind of reconsider, well, well, what did that mean? How did that happen? Um, what was that about when you said that, when you did that, when somebody else um, said that to me? So these are very important diachronic dimensions of, of human agency. Memory is just there in the background. Often we're not talking about memory when we're using memory in these ways. What we're talking about is people or jobs or emotions or ideals right, or relationships um, but we're using our memories our, our own and the shared memories of our shared experiences uh, to try to make sense of the past to direct our action into the future and to to kind of regulate our emotions um, over time as well so what we're interested in is is well are there cases in which by talking about the past together in this way by remembering together things happen right in the shared space that aren't just the sum of the parts so the that, that the classic phrase um more than the sum of the parts as a sort of sign or a symptom of emergence cases in which what happens when we remember together are not just um, the result of just putting together just juxtaposing what one person remembers and what another person remembers right um if you like you can think of of an example of of, of that as um, multiple witnesses in a court case, take a court case of people who've seen an accident or seen an incident on the street. The whole point of that, and I'll return to this later, is that the witnesses are presenting their independent accounts of the past. In other words, their memories are not meant to be shared. They're not meant to be interactively recollected. Witnesses are banned in most legislations from talking about what's happened before they present their testimony in court. So the, the, the testimony that comes up in court about the past is meant to be just independent and aggregated, right? It's up to the jury and or the judge um, to put it together. But the witnesses' um, memories themselves are not emergent. That is not the interactive recollection of shared experience. So what we're interested in is the difference between that kind of case, um, independent witnesses in court, and what happens with a couple or friends or colleagues who talk about the past together all the time so that I know what he thinks about this, how she feels about that event, um, or what people think was a success and a failure about the holiday that we took together and so on. Now, of course, these um, phenomena of shared remembering and collaborative recall have been theorized in many ways. Um, perhaps the, the, the most um, influential nowadays um, theoretical take on this is the notion of a transactive memory system. Uh, this is from Daniel Wegner, originally in the 1980s. A transactive memory system is a set of individual memory systems in combination with the communication between individuals. Okay, so, so this is an attempt to kind of map and describe the sort of emergent system um, where two or three or more people have a shared history of the kind I was saying. So just from that simple description from Wegener, you can see that there are two kinds of components involved in this transactive memory system. And again, think of a couple or a small family group. Um, so the, there's, there's the knowledge um, or the, the memory or memories, we might think, that's, that's distributed across different people. In a couple, of course, one person may know lots about the cars, another person may not know lots about the finances, another may know a lot about the, the, the holiday plans, right? Um, and that's differentiated very often. Um, one person may be um, give, given a role as a specialist or an expert on one part of the realm of knowledge um, in, in the couple, in the relationship. So there's a division of labor, a division of cognitive labor, a division of memory, mnemonic labor there. Um, but what makes it a transactive memory system is, is that both parties or all parties in the case of a larger group roughly know where that information is. So if, if, if one person is the expert on cars, another is the expert on finances, right? each of them is going to go to the other when they need to know or think or respond in some way about that other topic. 
right? And what that means is that each of them shares information about the location of the knowledge. So that's a kind of second order um, shared information, even though the first order, the basic information about cars or, or, or holidays or finances is differentiated. So that's the knowledge, but there's also these process components about how the system works. So every transactive memory system, every couple, every family, every group of work colleagues has a set of practices. They've got systems whereby new information that comes into the group should get funneled, should get challenged in the right way. Or oh, have you told X about what happened the other day when X was on holiday? You need to let them know. You need to update them. Um, and of course, then the practices of retrieving. Who should I ask about about the, 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 the family finances? Oh, go and talk to so-and-so. She's the one who knows about that. And then there has to be coordination to, to, to put all of that knowledge to work. Um, so over time, typically, um, you, you will share more information and, and use, learn how to use better the distributed expertise of the group of people who have um, this, uh, this shared history and shared experience. Okay, so here is an example. This is um, our kind of flagship example from our work with older couples from, from one of our earliest papers on this. Um, so what's happening here is that we'd asked um, couples to talk about, um, first of all, how they met and then their honeymoon. These are all, as I said, fairly fairly middle-class um, suburban um, Australian couples. So um, here they're talking about their honeymoon 40 years ago and they're just they're kind of free in free fall, free, free, free floating remembrance um, about what happened 40 years ago. So the wife says, we went to two shows. Can you remember what they were called? The husband says, we did. One was a musical, or were they both? I don't know. One, she goes, John Hansen was in it. Desert Song, he gets it. That's the name of the musical. The wife says, yes, she acknowledges it. Desert Song, that's it. I couldn't remember what it was called, but yes, I knew John Hansen was in it. Yes. Now, we think this is a very familiar kind of experience. Um, so I'm interested in your, your take on that. Is this the kind of thing that happens to you um, in ordinary life? Um, now, there's nothing magical going on here. It's, it's, it's a kind of emergence that's not really mysterious. Of course, the information was there. At, at, at least the husband had the capacity to access again Desert Song once he got the right cue. But it's also quite possible that he would have got that information without that specific cue and that nobody else except his wife could have given him that cue, right? They were the only people who were there. Um, on their honeymoon 40 years ago. Um, so it's a it's a very unique, very specific process by which they get at this information. I'll just close my window while I've got the machines working outside. There. Uh, one more example from a more recent study. This is um, work by our PhD student, Amanda Selwood, um, mm -hmm. on, on sisters, on siblings. Um, Amanda was looking at twins and siblings. And, and here they're remembering, the, the task is to remember the names of as many of their extended family as possible. This is a, a couple of Dutch sisters who were studying in Australia. So what's the other one's name? Um, Oma's sister, you met her, the one from Harlem. B just laughs. Dude, that's no help. Last B is not contributing anything. That's not, I forget what I, her name is. Um, she was really nice. Come on, the one who lived in the squishy apartment. And that picks up B's interest, the squishy apartment. Did you go to her house? She lives in Harlem. Oh, she has a small little apartment. And what's interesting here is that even though B up to this point has contributed nothing at all to this process, it's B who gets it. Yeah, yeah, her name is Ta Ta Tin Tinica. Yes, that's it. So again, cross queuing interactive process, including some laughter. Um, and this is not something that matters a lot. I mean, this is obviously not a family member they know really well. This is for a weird psychology test, but here they go. Together, they produce something that possibly neither of them could have produced on their own. Now, just to mention these memory processes are not, I mean, we, sh we shouldn't think of them in, in isolation. Um, there's a whole lot of other collaborative cognitive processes, uh, in which very similar operations and mechanisms are involved. Um, so I guess in the past, brainstorming and problem solving has, has been studied in psychology quite a lot and collaborative creativity, I should say, as well. Now, I mean, those of you who are, who are um, academics, I don't know what it's like in, in, uh, in your system, but certainly in Australia and, and in many parts of Europe, often nowadays we're told to you know, go and do some group work um you know put out put your heads together they say to come up with some ideas about um you know how the university should operate in future and the typical feeling is that that kind of brainstorming activity among a kind of random group 
often doesn't work that well, right? Um, you're just given a t kind of top-down instruction of something to do. You're working with people you don't really know very well. Um, and so the conditions for success in group processes are actually quite tricky. Um, and one of the, the other domains in which I'm interested in collaboration that's part of the project Chris mentioned um, that I'm working on here in Paris is collaborative wayfinding. Um, in other words, what happens when you, you are trying to navigate together with your partner or with a friend or with a, with a family member? Um, you know, there's a lot of work, for example, on um, how does GPS um, and, and, you know, using your maps on Google's on your phone, to, does that kind of degrade your memory? Does it mean that you don't uh, actually uh, understand the navigational layout of a city as well as people used to in the old days before before smartphones? But of course, what, what we're usually doing is doing that together. And, um, you know, I think many people are familiar with, with you know, conflict in how should we interpret this GPS device? Um, you know, and, and often things go wrong in the collaborative process. So, it's a general problem about collaborative cognition. It's not just like putting two separate people to work, right, and letting them go. When there's collaboration, it's more complicated than that. Okay, so now continuing this process of, of panning back um, to, 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 to explain what was happening in this Wisconsin moment, I'm going to take you through the very um, simple shape of the collaborative recall research paradigm, the experimental paradigm, uh, which we didn't initiate, which was, was in play well before we started work on this. Um, so I'll just take a minute to explain what you're seeing on this screen here. Um, so on the left, um, we have six individuals. So I is for individual, um, three in the top, three at the bottom. Um, and in that first phase, the learning and recall one, um, they learn some information. And it could be anything. It could be a, a random word list. Um, it could be that they watch a video in which some events happen. Does, doesn't matter for the moment. Let's just think about they're, they're learning a random list of words for now. Um, at the second phase, recall two, you can see something different happens at the top and the bottom. So the top is a collaborative group. Um, and at recall two, they would be asked to work together to collaborate, in other words, to try to remember as many of the words as they can together. Um, meanwhile, the other group, the, the individuals, will just be asked to remember individually. And again, you know, they, they come up with as many as they can on their own, but there's no interaction between the three at, at recall two. Um, so what we're interested in then first in this collaborative recall paradigm is to compare this, um, what happens, for example, how many words does the collaborating group come up with at, at recall two? And then what do we compare that with? Well, obviously we could compare it with just any one individual, but that's not really fair, right? Because the collaborating group has three individuals, um, so it should be compared with, with a, a similar number of people three individuals. So what we do um, is we call these three individuals in the, the second, the bottom, the nominal group, we call them a nominal group and we measure their output, we measure their memory um, by totting up what they recall separately and then pooling the result, pooling the output. Um, now, of course, we don't count twice, we don't double dip. If, if individual number one and individual number three come up with the same answer, we don't count that as two. Um, what we're interested in is the non-redundant output of the same number of individuals working alone. So in the case of, of remembering word lists, we just get a number. Um, what is the number of, of items that the collaborating group recalled? And what's the number of items that the nominal group recalled? Is that clear enough? Um, I, I hope it'll be clearer when I explain the typical result, right? The typical result is collaborative inhibition. Um, so this is just a, a, a sample um, graph describing very typical um, results that we see in many, many of these studies. Um, on the left, this so imagine this is a long list of words, which would be very hard to remember. On the left, you see the average result for an individual is just under 30%, just under 0.3. Um, for, that's for any one individual um, when they're remembering this, this, this list on their own. Um, but then when we get to the, um, the, the next group, um, we see that the collaborative group, um, when they're working together, does better than the individual. So that's good, right? That, but that's also what you'd expect because it's three people rather than one. They remember just about half of the items, just under 0.5. But then look at the right-hand column. That's the nominal group. So that's what happens when you allow the three individuals to work separately and then you pool their output, you pool their results. So what you see there is that the nominal group, and this is a very robust result, it happens a lot of the time, the nominal group outperforms the collaborative group. Another way of putting that, collaborating groups very often do not perform to their potential, right? Because if, if, if you just left them alone, right, they would have done better once you pooled their output. 
So there's what we call process loss, but something about the collaboration, something about the process of collaboration means that they don't perform up to their potential. As I said, this is a, a, an effect we find in many different cases um, for, for word lists, for, for pictures. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about um, what happens when we, we make the information that's being remembered more relevant, more personally relevant, things do change then. But what's a bit surprising, it takes a bit to, to kind of get to know this, get to understand this, is it's not just a matter of effort, right? Because when you offer substantial financial rewards or when you make a competition in which the, the winning group is gonna be well rewarded, um, the groups don't do any better. The collaborating groups don't do any better. It's not just a matter of sort of people lay, lying back and being lazy and thinking that their collaborating partners will do the job. They can say, I'm really trying, you know, and I, I'm pretty sure that we'll we'll do really well as a group. We seem to be getting on really well, people say, but they actually don't. So there's something deeper. There's something more cognitive, some mechanism that that makes it hard, right, for, for collaborating groups to remember effectively together. Very standard explanation. It's, it's that, well, when you remember stuff, when you encode stuff, you'll typically have a kind of individual strategy. You'll, you'll impose some organization on the material that you've learned. I mean, think of learning a list of words. You'll, there'll be some way in which you kind of put them in categories, even if they're not categorized. You'll, you'll work them out. And when you recall them, when you retrieve them, um, you'll try to follow your individual strategy uh, to get at the list you're remembering. When you work with other people, that process, that individual process of, of um, using your individual strategy is disrupted because you've got to listen to other people. Um, you're monitoring whether they've said what you've said. Um, and so um, what, what psychologists have typically found is, is that to get a group to do better, you actually make it less of a group. I'll explain what that means. You tell people, for example, well, don't listen to what your colleagues are saying. Um, just take turns, for example. You do one, then your colleague can do one, then your other colleague can do one. Um, but don't let your own processes, don't let your own strategies get disrupted by what the others are doing. So in other words, you're making the group a mere aggregate. You're making it, in a sense, not really a group at all. And then collaborative inhibition can come close to disappearing. Okay, so that is a surprising um, scientific result. And I'm going to, from here on, just show how we've we've kind of complicated it or puzzled at it because we we um, we thought from the beginning that surely in some circumstances shared history should help. It should be good for remembering because we do a lot of remembering together all the time. Now, one one puzzle is well, in the real world, you know, psychology experiments are meant to tell us something about the real world. Um, what's what's the parallel? What's the connection? Right? How do we pan back? Um, from this experimental design to say, well, how memory works in the real world. And let me go back to the case of, of a, uh, a court case in which witnesses have um, given their evidence independently of each other. So even in that case, right, either the jury or the judge has to construct a narrative, right, using the information provided by all the separate witnesses. So that's a process of, if you like, pooling the non-redundant items, the non-redundant memories that the individual witnesses have given. Now, in the experiment, the way we do it is, is a kind of idealized or automated procedure. We, we just check, right? And we, we make the full list of all the items that the individuals have, have produced. In the real world, with more complicated information that's being remembered about the color of the shirt of the, the criminal or whatever, um, there's a lot more room for difficulty. There's a lot more challenge involved in pooling the information of the individuals, right? Um, so we can't assume a kind of idealized aggregation procedure, right? Information has to be put together in some way or other. Now in cognitive psychology for, for many years, this result of collaborative inhibition um, was, was very influential. Psychologists used it actually to support what was already the case in, in the legal profession, um, as I mentioned, that co-witnesses are banned. So people who've been witnesses to the same event are banned from discussing what happened before they give their testimony in court. Um, now, that's typically not um, been a result that's applied to police, right? So in many jurisdictions, police are allowed to discuss and negotiate um, the narrative they're going to tell in court about what happened in an event that they were all part of. And one of the, the jobs of psychologists um, using this um, information is to try and make police have a good hard look at themselves about what the justification is for uh, allowing them to um, collaborate when they don't allow witnesses to collaborate. Well, generally in psychology, um, the fact that human memory is, is kind of malleable and open to social influence 
has often been seen as a problem, as a, as a deficit. So this is a kind of social implementation, a social application of, of a general tendency in psychology to see constructive processes in remembering as a kind of problem, right? As, as a, a, a path towards error and a path towards distortion, as a, as a, a kind of un, unhappy byproduct of the way that the human brain evolved. Um, and the, the fact that these constructive processes are seen as bad and that specifically social influences are seen as bad is shown even in the names of, of kind of applications of experimental paradigms in psychology that are used to test these social processes. So memory conformity is when you want to remember the same as your colleagues and collaborators. Memory contagion is when a piece of misinformation spreads right from one person through a group, like wildfire, as we say, and, and people end up remembering um, similar misinformation in some cases. So the picture here um, on the left is of Elizabeth Loftus, the very um, celebrated and, and, and remarkable cognitive psychologist of memory. Um, she's definitely the most um, famous and most uh, uh, outspoken proponent of this view that the isolated individual brain is the gold standard for, for memory. Because our memory is malle malleable, she says, it's susceptible to suggest, su suggestive influences from other people. Now, we've taken a kind of very different line um, that's, that's cued by the philosopher Sue Campbell. That's her book on the right, Our Faithfulness to the Past. Um, Sue Campbell argues that there's no um, good inference from construction to distortion, that it's, it's not right that to think that because memory is constructive, because we're open to influence, because we put lots of information together in, in kind of creative ways, that that inevitably means that memory is fictional, false, or in error. So what, what I'm going to say now about our philosophically inspired interventions into this experimental paradigm are kind of driven by a, a wish to push back against Loftus's um, concern that construction leads to distortion. So we noticed that the, the, the experimental paradigms of the kind that I've been discussing actually explore very small spaces, very small regions of the, of the possible and indeed the actual kinds of collaborative memory that happens in, in, in ordinary social life. So just think of those uh, that description I gave you. You know, typically you've got a collaborating group, which is three strangers who've come into a psychology lab. Um, they're typically first year undergraduates in in, in most uh, contexts, and they get given this strange task of remembering a list of words, right? Um, and they get co course credit or perhaps a financial motivation for um, for doing this task. But are they really a group? Well, it's a pretty minimal kind of group. It's not like a couple who've lived together for many years or a group of three people who've worked together for many years. What they encoded, what they're, they're, they've been asked to remember, is kind of accidental from the point of view of, of, of human agency. It's not something they've experienced together. Um, it's not like a group of three people remembering a holiday that they took together in the past. Typically, what's recalled is not significant, whether it's a list of random words or a list of random pictures, um, it's material with no personal importance. And in many cases, the interaction between the group members is, is pretty minimal, uh, whether it's, it's actually turn taking or it's just that they're trying to work through and be done with the experiment and get out and finish their course credit. There's no particular reason um, to work hard to try to get at the highest number or the best kind of uh, recall that you can. So I'm now going to present just a few complications, um, a few ways of pushing back against the consensus of, against the typical collaborative inhibition result uh, that we've done over the years. Um, so first of all, um, when you encode material together in a, a more elaborative way, in a more, um, in a more significant way, collaborative inhibition disappears. Collaborative inhibition is eliminated. So I'll explain uh, what I mean by this. Um, so uh, collaborative, uh, when collaborating groups actually generate material together, right, um, they recall as much as the nominal groups. So how we did this was um, we we would uh, get the information to be to be recalled was um, we'd give people or a group, we'd give the individual or a group an adjective like uh, narcissistic or um, dull, and we would ask them to come up with the name of a person who fit this um, this mode. So in the case of strangers, in the case of, of individuals working in nominal groups, this would have to be a famous person. And so we did that also with some collaborative groups. Just ask, well, who's a person who, who you think of who's narcissistic, right? And you come up with a famous person, and then that's what you have to remember. Or also with, with uh, collaborating groups of, of people who know each other, it could be somebody that you know, who's a person you know, who's dull, who's exciting, who's narcissistic, or so on. 
And so the point of this is that it, it is that you have to work together to come up with the material that you're then going to remember, right? You, you are collectively generating the name, the person who fits that uh, personality characteristic. When you've done that work, when you've done that work of encoding together, that in, in a way, um, you get a deeper depth, you get a, a deeper depth of encoding and it's better for memory um, at the other end. So this is a, a kind of collective version of what's called in, in memory psychology, the generation effect. In other words, material that you've generated yourself, that you've created yourself, is easier to remember. You remember it better um, than material that you've just been given at random to remember. Second outcome is, is to look at a slightly different phase of the process. So here at Recall 3, what we typically do in these experiments is, is we separate the group out again and we test them again as individuals. So what we've got the circle around here is the group that were collaborating in Recall 2, but now we test them again at a later date. This might be a week later or a month later or, or a couple of years later. Um, we test them again on the same information. And then we do that same thing with the one who'd never been collaborating, with the ones who were in the nominal group. Now, what happens here? Well, in this case, um, uh, oh yes, yeah, so we go back. In, in, in the case we're going to look at now, what we what we manipulated was the kind of interaction. So at Recall 2, in the results I'm about to report to you, at Recall 2 for the collaborating group, we told, told them to interact strongly so that you reach consensus, right? Do, well, we don't want you just to take turns and agree to, to differ about what you think was um, uh, the material you to remember. We want you to make sure that you all agree. We want a unanimous consensus about what you remember. Now, that doesn't change the basic result. Collaborative inhibition is still there at recall two. So what I'm showing you first there is what happens at recall two, the middle phase. At recall two, we still get the nominal group performing best. Um, and neither group, neither a turn-taking group, nor this group we asked to find consensus um, does better. But when we, so next, I'm going to show you the results at recall three. Um, and what happens here at recall three is that there's a dramatic benefit for collaboration and specifically for collaboration by this consensus mechanism, by this way of, of actually getting um, deeper interactive uh, agreement in the process of retrieval. So what we think happens here, so the, the results here show that the consensus group, the group that we asked to, to come to an agreement, make sure you're unanimous, basically um, stopped any of the individuals having intrusions. It stopped any false memories, to put it another way, in the individuals who later went away from the collaboration and when they remembered themselves, they didn't have any false memories um, because they managed to correct each other during the process of collaboration by checking, by monitoring each other in the interactive turn taking. Um, they'd made sure that they kind of eliminated mistakes. And that's a remarkable result um, because it's, it's often very common that we get uh, intrusions and uh, mistakes when you've um, been remembering complicated material. Okay, we're getting closer to coming back to the Wisconsin moment. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is the sort of general shape of our alternative way of understanding remembering together. So I've just given you a couple of examples of ways in which we've we've kind of manipulated the experimental design a little bit, changing the materials, ch changing the tasks. But what we think is most promising is to change the kind of group, to look at different interactive processes in the way that people remember the past together, and to look specifically at persisting integrated systems, um, people who have a shared history over time, who work together over time. And so to come back to the older couples, we've done this sequence of studies with, with older couples who we think are potentially transacted memory systems with shared strategies at those two levels of, of the distribution of knowledge and process. And they have a rich cognitive and emotional interdependence. I'll show you a graph of one of our first studies with, with older couples. Um, now, the details here don't matter. What, what I want to point to, um, basically, green is, is collaborative facilitation or benefit. Um, so people who do better when they're working together at a task. The red um, is people who, couples who don't do better, who do worse when they're collaborating. But what's interesting here is the variation, right? It, it looks like there's a lot of mess in the, these results. And so initially we're going, well, this is a problem. You know, this doesn't look like clean, nice psychology data. But then we thought, is, actually, isn't this the point, right? Rather than thinking about this variation as noise, each couple really has a different kind of mechanism, a different way of operating uh, when they work together. So I'm just going to give you a couple of examples now, qualitative examples of, of, of real cases in which uh, older couples were working together. And the task I'm going to show you a couple of examples of is, is it's a kind of semantic memory task, but it's one with personal significance. So what we asked them to do 
in each case, these middle class couples, we worked out, is there a club or some kind of community organization that you're both part of? Something that you go to meetings, right? This is well before lockdown, you go to meetings and you know the people in the club. And we, when we found one um, for those couples, we said, okay, great. Um, can you remember as many names of, as possible of the people in that club? We made sure it was a club that both both members, both both the husband and the wife were part of. And so we do that first individually. Um, so we'd ask the husband and the wife to remember those names individually. Then a week later, we'd come back and we'd put them together. And we say, okay, can you together, can you collaborate to remember the names of your friends in this club? So here's a couple of examples. From couple one, um, so this is from their individual interview. So you see F, the, the woman, the female, um, comes up with all of these names. Um, and the man comes up with names, he gives the surnames. But um, when you pull their recall, these individual interviews, they're, they're not collaborating in this case a, a week earlier, they come up with 17 names in this case. So that's, that's an okay result. But what happens when we put them together a week later? So the same couple in the collaborative interview, they, they start with the committee and they laugh. We've got David and Alison. He gives the surname Beard, John Edwards, his wife, Helen. We have Jack, and he can't remember Jack's wife, but she can, of course, June. June Yarrington, Fred, and they talk over in an overlapping way, Fred and Zoe Simmons, right? So what's happening here is, is and we'll, that continues as they, they just work together. Um, there's a lot of cross-queuing going on, a little bit of incidental detail, the pilot, the retired conscious pilot. This couple does a lot better when they work together than when they were working alone. The collaborative recall produces 30 names compared to their pooled individual recall producing just 17 names. So they've kind of got a strategy, they provide cues from each other. This is successful collaboration. This is collaborative facilitation, collaborative benefit or process gain, we can say. Contrast, you can tell what I'm gonna do now, a, a case where it doesn't work so well. Um, couple two actually knew their, their, their friends' names much better. So when they did it on their own, and we pulled them, they got 50 names between the two of them. So good good effort, that that, that looks very good, that this is uh, a couple with good knowledge of the uh, names of their friends in the club. But then in collaborative recall, things do not go so well. Um, they only produce 32 names. What happens, why does this happen? Well, it's because they have very different strategy. The man works through them in alphabetical order um, and the woman goes around the room, a very different strategy. And then she basically gives up. Um, because it's not working. They're not doing the same thing. They're not quite um, uh, playing the same game in memory. And certainly there's no cross queuing. So in this case, we get collaborative inhibition, very strong collaborative inhibition. They do worse when they work together. So over a range of studies, we've kind of probed and quantified these differences in, in interactive style and collaborative style. And we've, we've coded their interactions of how couples work together and we come up with, with factors that we call group enhancing and group diminishing. This is just sort of labels for the things that correlate with success, with facilitation, and the things that correlate with, with failure, with inhibition in collaboration. So what's good, what's good, what's a good sign for a couple or any other group that's remembering together is that you cue each other, not surprisingly. Um, but actually, even cues that don't work, even cues that are not picked up, are a good sign. They're a good thing. It's 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 a good sign of the group working together well as a transactive memory system. If people are trying to, do, you know, do you remember that that guy who wears a hat? Even if the other person doesn't come up with an answer, it shows that the system is working well together. Of course, successful responses to cues also help. And also, an interesting factor is repetitions. You know, if I if you say, you know, do you remember the guy who wears a hat? And I just say, oh, the guy wears a hat. Even if we don't get that, that kind of repetition turns out is a good thing. It's a good sign that the system is working well. In contrast, the group diminishing factor, um, things that don't correlate well with success in collaboration. When, when you assign expertise to one person only in the group, when you disagree about the strategy, you know, do you go in alphabetical order or do you go around the room? When you correct each other, now that's an interesting one. Um, you know, you can see why in a couple, you know, it's probably not such a good sign if one one person is continually correcting the other. It makes you feel, oh, you know, the, 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 there's an emotional difficulty to the cognitive process there. What's interesting about that, though, is that we find a different result um, when we look at siblings. Actually, with siblings, with, with, with siblings, same-sex siblings or different-sex siblings, um, they can correct each other, and that turns out to be a good thing. Um, so we think, well, maybe, you know, you can't sort of get rid of your sibling. I mean, so maybe there's less of an emotional problem about correcting your sibling. Whereas with a couple, you know, it seems emotionally perhaps not so appropriate for correction to happen. But that's something for us to uh, continue studying in the future. 
And just I'll give you a couple of examples of, of what the couples themselves say about their memory practices. So um, this is just a, a generic take. Um, if, if we're telling a story and I say there were 10 wild dogs in the back garden, and was, if I give a false memory, a wild, fantastical memory, I don't want my wife to tell me, no, there's only two. I don't want her to correct me. I, if I'm telling a good story and I said there were 10 wild dogs, then there were 10 wild dogs. So that's a case in, in which we see the function of memory is storytelling. It's entertainment. It's pleasure. It's, it's creating or reaffirming the, the community or the relationship, right? It's not about precision. It's not about accuracy. It's not about the truth. Another case, we, we also looked at pronoun use, and some couples use we a lot more than, than others. Um, so we never stop talking, do we? We talk all the time. And so that's just, a, it's an obvious sign uh, that the shared history is still alive. It's still animating the ordinary communication processes in collaborative remembering. Um, I'm just going to skip this this, uh, this this couple of slides about um, emergence there because I want to get on to this, this general, um, I guess, conclusion about this research program on collaborative remembering. So what we, we think we've, we've shown, and lots of other groups have been doing similar work over the last 10 years as well, is that, yes, actually, sometimes there are emergent benefits. Sometimes collaboration can work. It can be helpful. It can facilitate memory. But the conditions for that are fragile, right? And you can't take it for granted, right? Just putting a random group of people and asking them to remember um, irrelevant information is not likely to work. So there's been, I think, a new focus in collaborative memory research on the variability um, of memory practices and processes and the specificity of tasks, right? It's, it's hard to work out when a couple or a group will do better. It depends a lot on their micro strategies and how they operate together with their shared history. So at a kind of general level, um, we think this is this is a nice example of a case in which philosophical views, views in cognitive theory, um, distributed cognition and transactive memory systems most generally, have actually influenced an empirical psychology research program in cognitive psychology that had its own life, it had its own momentum. It didn't start because we started asking these questions. Um, but it's a it's what we think of as a kind of productive um, effect of interdisciplinary interaction here. All right, that's been a long detour. We now get to come back to Howard and Fran and the Wisconsin moment, um, to what we call remembering in the wild. So, you know, we, we'd been doing this work for years, but we'd been left, we'd been aware of how much was left out of the data that we collect. Um, so we go into couples' homes instead of bringing them into the lab, and we ask them about things that matter, their honeymoons and the people they know. We talked a lot about the embodied and distributed nature of collaborative memory ecologies. But we still have to exclude a lot right, to, to, to build the bridges back to the experimental tradition. So we didn't think we were quite studying remembering in the wild yet. Now, before we return to Fran and Howard and, and the Wisconsin moment, there's one more researcher here to account for, Kath, with her video cameras. So we've been trialing an ethnography of experimental psychology, right? And now there's been a bit of work like this. Much of it is critical, kind of critical neuroscience, um, kind of undermining the validity of the research by saying that, you know, psychologists don't really take culture into account or that they, they do um, illegitimate controls on the complexity of real life behavior. Now, we're aware of those concerns, but we, we, we didn't want to be quite so critical as that. We're, our mode of interaction is more entangled, um, as shown in the article by Fitzgerald and Callard here, just like take some risk. Um, and in, in our case, by working ethnographically from the inside, by trying to look at our own research processes from the outside, by bringing an ethnographer into the team. So a kind of inside outside process all at once. So Kath is here um, with sitting on the ground with her notebook. She attended testing sessions in November, 2016. And Tom ran the test sessions as always um, with an audio recording, which was transcribed, coded, and used for um, quantitative research outputs. But Kath also took extensive field notes, and she also recorded video footage from two different angles on GoPros. And she conducted open-ended interviews directly after the testing with the couple to learn about their experience of what had happened, um, as well as their thoughts on specific moments during the test. So we then, Kath and I, selected video footage of a small number of moments of interest to show to our, our broader research team. And so we had long sessions just going through the video of what had happened um, and getting the whole team to discuss what was going on, what was happening in, in that process. And, and to reflect on the, I guess, the point and the aim um, of our research. So um, 
after Kath had attended two uh, testing sessions, um, we discussed this moment um, between Howard and Fran, the Wisconsin moment, um, and the team had some very clear uh, attitudes and suggestions about what was happening here. So remember that Howard cut off Fran's suggestion when Fran came up with Wis Wis Wisconsin. He says, no, 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 I'm working down the east coast of the state. So it read like a moment of shutdown. Certainly when you read the transcript, that's how it seems. Fran And Fran kind of interrupts her own responses as a result. And the team saw Fran's quietness in the transcript as a kind of withdrawal from the task. And when she was fidgeting, they thought that means she's nervous. She's kind of self-soothing. Now, when we computed the, the, the results in ordinary fashion from these, um, these sessions, we found the kinds of, same kinds of results we'd found before. So on the words trials, um, what we're looking at here is, importantly, the difference between session one on the one hand, which is the people working individually, and then sessions two and three are collaborative. In words, we get standard collaborative inhibition or at least no, no benefits. But look at the two tasks for countries, European countries and mutual friends. In those cases, there's clear collaborative facilitation. There's process gain. There's a collaborative benefit here. So that's that's like interesting. That's good when when we let the couples talk about things that they have more interest in, and, and certainly for the mutual friends, that's a very strong um, positive result. And again, we we found what happens uh, when we code the interaction is the same kinds of, of factors: group enhancing factors, cues and repetitions, even failed cues are are good for collaboration. The group diminishing factor, factor three in that table, um, when there's lots of corrections, when the strategy disagreements or a nominated expert. So all of those findings drew, drove what we thought about the Wisconsin moment, that, that single uh, interaction between Howard and Fran. And the team pointed out that it, for our middle class couples, at least, men often dominate in this task. They take it on themselves. They confidently start a list. Um, they operate on some geographic or idiosyncratic frame of their own. And women's potential contributions are often lost, right? Um, any unique knowledge that the woman has, but the man doesn't, often doesn't make it into the shared space, right? And that's a deep problem um, in collaborative work. And this task exacerbates that challenge, right? The couples know there's some target number, there's 50-something you know, US states they know, and they're aware that they've got nowhere near 50, and so they get anxious, right? Um, and so the, in this case, after the Wisconsin moment between Howard and Fran, the, the kind of the playfulness is not really strong. They're, they're struggling, they're anxious about this. Yes, all of that's true. The Wisconsin moment was shut down, and yet there is another take possible on this. So Kath had a second video, um, reverse angle, which showed the couple's faces and emotions from this angle and their body language kind of differently in and after the Wisconsin moment. From this point of view, Fran turns towards Howard, touches him on the arm, and they share a laugh. They mirror a smile as if to say, well, of course that would be your strategy. From the transcript alone, the mere words, right, that doesn't show their looks, it doesn't show their interaction, the comfort, the acknowledgement, some playful enjoyment, and that she's still monitoring, she's still engaged in the task. There is some shutdown, but that is not all. Right? So when we reverse the angle, there's more going on. Right? Expertise is not always trouble. Sometimes a cognitive division of labor makes good sense in everyday context. So there can be a strategy difference, a difference in strategy without a mismatch, without trouble. And at another point in the session, Howard says, yes, I'm a thing person, and Fran's a people person. And in this test, when Howard mentioned the states in the middle, remember that Fran said, yeah, the ones where they all voted for Trump. So they have their own very different takes on what they're doing here. So we think there's a resilience built, built into this arrangement, this cognitive um, habit system between the, the two. Fran's not completely shut down. She remains engaged. And later, Kath discusses the way they work together in ordinary life in remembering and planning and in managing. Kat says, are you a system? And Howard says, well, it's not so much a system. It's, it's a way we've developed our relationship, I suppose. It wasn't planned. It just happened. So there are beneficial knock-on effects of the strategy Howard imposes. Her, and when they later do the countries in Europe, this time they adopt the same strategy together. They work across the continent together, following Howard's lead, like moving down from Scandinavia. And they actually get a much better result in that case. So to, to conclude by commenting on some features that we see from the, this ethnographic point of view, the dynamics of the participants' performance in these memory experiments are surprisingly emotional, right? Um, typically, we wash this out. There's a lot of emotions in, in circulation. Um, we see anxiety, we see complaint, and we see compliance. Um, they're nervous about the tests, even though they want to contribute to science. 
Even though they're in their homes, it's a strange environment. And Fran takes it all very personally. Only with Kath's interview um, did it actually turn out that um, uh, Fran is a, a very active member of a local wildlife society. And she is one of the people who um, knows all of the names of the local birds and, and Australian animals. She has an extremely lively and precise memory for the names of birds. And this just wouldn't come out when we're asking her to remember random lists of countries or, or words. Howard, in contrast, isn't so anxious about doing the test. He says, I don't see these tests as things that apply to me as a person. All I'm doing is giving you information that's going to become a point on a graph, right? So in interestingly different uh, angles on the test. When we zoom out a little bit further, um, we can also treat the whole experiment as our unit of analysis. In other words, we can include the experimenters. Right? And again, it's a weird situation. Um, this is the third time Tom and the experimenters have come to people's homes. So there's a kind of comfort to it. They're used to being watched and tested and observed. And so we were interested in the consistency and the care. Tom is the main experimenter, has a very clear and consistent diction and volume and his facial movements. And they're, they're consistent across the couples. He puts the timer on, he lets them go, and he adopts this neutral, relaxed posture to encourage them to focus. And, and the, the couples say they appreciate this. He's very easy to understand. He reflected, it's it's very hard when they're telling stories about the past. I, I can't react. I can't laugh along with them. And it turns out uh, another research researcher who'd been doing this had actually kind of engaged too much and found a lot of humor uh, in what the couple said. And, and that ended up not helping the couples to do the memory tasks um, as well. So there's a lot of labor in the experimental work here. Um, well, by the open-ended discussion time after testing, we, we started to make them feel, you know, a little bit less like a number, more like a part of the process and a, a kind of time-consuming but very personal um, search for the causes of Alzheimer's. And the final topic I'll just um, conclude on is to look at embodied and spatial dynamics that are shown by the video in a way that the mere transcript of the words, the transcript of what they said, doesn't show. First of all, it's interesting that Howard and Fran chose to sit side by side on, on the sofa. So we didn't so tell them anything. You could sit wherever you like. Where would you be comfortable? And this couple chose to sit on the sofa. They're not around a table with, with the researchers. Now, looking at the video, well, were they a bit stiff and anxious? Or, or did their physical proximity sitting next to each other potentially support richer channels of interaction? They can nod and murmur and touch each other, trigger and support each other's memories. So you've got to consider their situated emotional responses. It's just interesting that where people choose to sit can have an impact on how they can or can't work together. This raises questions for future experiments. Should we control or prescribe? Should we tell them you must sit at a table? Um, and when, when we showed this to the whole team, um, this was the first time the team had really thought about this. Um, some of the team members said, it, well, it looks like they're, they're kind of nervous. They can't really look at each other. They're quite stiff. They can't interact. And then they said, well, well that isn't a table more formal? And, and they check, well, we let them choose. And so tables um, turn out to be an important psychology for uh, a, a methodology for psychology. This is a piece by the anthropologist Emily Martin on the role of tables um, in psychology. Emily Martin suggests that tables stabilize people. And she says, in the contemporary lab, the place of the psychological subject in relation to an experiment is not open for debate. A subject sits at a table and yields data to the machines. Now, we think things are a little more complicated than that, whether it's a table or not. And just one example we'll give of, of a kind of um, a new insight we got from doing this ethnographic and video work um, is relation to mirrored repetition. So we had often found, as, as I said, that when you repeat back something that somebody said, that's a good sign. For example, if you're remembering names and, and one person says Diane Miller and the other says, yes, die, of course. Or what about your golf club? Oh, yes, my golf club, yes. So that's one of the factors in this group enhancing factor. Repetitions are a definite good sign. Um, they help couples work together in remembering. But what was striking in the video um, was that there are nonverbal repetitions, um, ways in, in which somebody just clearly acknowledges and repeats just by nodding what the other partner has said. And Tom, when he looked back at the film of this, he said, filming is so great in terms of mirror repetition the number of nonverbal mirrored repetitions is probably double the verbal. He just nods, ah, uh, when she says something, but he didn't say it, so we can't measure it. Right? And so there's a whole new question about, well, should we measure nonverbal mirrored repetitions? 
And of course, there's also a mirroring of emotional responses. Laughter can play a kind of role very like um, repeating what somebody says. So the embodied evidence, the behavioral evidence kind of supports, but also extends the verbal data, the way that we have uh, looked at this material in the past. And later in the interview, Howard says, well, yeah, doing the test with somebody else helps you to get over a block because you can think of something else. You can look at the other person that will untie the block so that you'll be able to remember the other things that you, and then they start talking over each other. She says, it triggers something, doesn't it? And he says, yeah, the things that you've missed. So we've gone on to later work on nonverbal interaction. And the last part here is about the intelligent use of space. So I mentioned earlier that Howard had been talking about the, watching the US elections, the, the Trump elections on, on TV the last week. Now, you can't really see it in the, the, the pictures here, but the, there was a blank TV screen in the room that's kind of behind Tom. Um, and, and Howard had actually been looking at that screen. And he said, yeah, you see a map presented on the screen with the state's names on it during the election coverage. And he said, that's what I was working off. Right? And so in a sense, he's projecting on to the screen a mechanism of remembering the U.S. states. So this is what David Kirsch, the distributed cognition theorist, called the intelligent use of space. Now, this just wouldn't have come up with just our analysis of the transcript of the words. He also used his hands a lot. And of course, gestural, co-speech gestures are an important part of, of memory and thinking. So it's very striking. One of Kath's conclusions um, from uh, doing this ethnographic work was to say that, well, the way we do the tests, it's very ecologically valid and it's in the home, but it actually eliminates a lot of external scaffolding. Um, so they rely on each other, but they can't get up and fetch an atlas. They can't look at photos. Um, they can't do anything using artifacts or movement um, to answer the tests. So we want to look more at how um, couples uh, use together different kinds of artifacts. Um, and uh, I don't have time to go through them, but we've got some examples here of, of which kind of diaries and calendars and, and, and whiteboards people use um, to coordinate their memories for, for things to do. Uh, so to finish, the payoffs of this um, experiment. experiment. So again, we won't do this, doing this to kind of debunk or criticize um, the ambition of psychological um, science to do experiments in a rigorous and objective way. Um, perhaps, you know, you might read what we've done as, as kind of the opposite of just trying to incorporate more ordinary life into the scientific, quantitative, experimental, objectifying process. Like perhaps now that we've seen these nonverbal repetitions, um, we'll find a way to code them, to turn them into numbers, right? To turn qualitative records of specific interactions into yet more quantifiable codes. And of course, there are much more general questions about the specificity of results in psychology, uh, given the replication crisis, which I'd be happy to, to talk through in, in question time. But most generally, where, where we're stuck at the moment, you know, are, are we um, expanding the unit of analysis in a way that criticizes psychology, or are we doing psychology in a more, uh, an even more universalizing way than it's been done in the past, uh, trying to identify yet more factors that we can record and measure and code? And <laughs> we hope, is in a sense, we're, we're kind of doing both. And I'll stop there with um, with many thanks to my co-authors and the rest of the research team, Amanda, Sophia, Tom, Nina, and Penny. And I can stop sharing my screen. And thank you very much for your attention to all of that. Uh, did that work? Am I off? Yeah, yeah, it worked. Great. Thanks so much, John.